Thank you guys for inviting me here to visit you again in Colombia. It's very nice to be here. So I'm going to talk today about language mapping in aphasia. I, obviously, I need to start with some definitions. Well, not of aphasia, but of language mapping. Um, oh, yeah, but now the, the new custom is to put the acknowledgements first, and I think that that's a good custom that, the, that we've converged on. So I would like to say that the studies the majority of the work that I'm going to talk about today was done by Dana Erickson, uh, who was a speech language pathologist in my lab, and Melody Yen, who is currently a PhD student in my lab. She'll be graduating soon, if anybody is looking for an amazing postdoc. <laughs> and I've also um, outlined here all the other lab members who've made various contributions to the studies that I'm going to talk about. And our research, uh, we we'll always appreciate people with aphasia that make it possible, and of course the NIH for supporting our work. So what is language mapping and why do we need to do it in aphasia? By language mapping, I mean using functional imaging to identify brain regions that are involved in language processing. This is done routinely in clinical contexts. Anytime that you want to do any surgery anywhere near a possible language area, people use fMRI preclinically to identify which regions are critical for language and try and minimize the um, resection of those areas. Um, in, a, in aphasia, I'm very interested, as I know many of the people in this room are, uh, in uh, functional plasticity. We know that after a stroke, um, almost everybody gets better over time. Some to a great extent and some to a much lesser extent. Um, regardless of where you start, you're going you're gonna to Im improve over time, but we don't really know why. The fact that people improve suggests that there is probably some kind of functional reorganization taking place. And that is um, the object of um, you know, many of our research programs, is to understand what kind of functional reorganization underlies the improvement in function that we see over the first weeks and months uh, after a stroke. So we sort of have some pretty good sense, I think, of what the language network looks like in a healthy brain. And so I've got up here, I'm not going to go into any of the details, but I have up here the, the famous Hickok and Popple model, and I'm sure I, I would look forward to seeing Greg's um, updates on that next week. This um, amazing paper by Kathy Price from 2012, um, where she parcelates the language network into lots of more components. And then our own um, contribution to this kind of modeling, which review are permitting, you guys might be able to see in a few weeks or months. Um, so we, we sort of have ideas of what the normal um, brain organization for language looks like. And the question is like, what happens when, no, when one or more nodes of that are damaged? Like what's the possibility of other regions to take on those functions? We know in principle that language reorganization, uh, that language can be processed by different areas other than the ones that normally do so. So if this is a study in children who had perinatal or prenatal stroke, and this is, and this is using a verb generation task which activates very lateralized frontal and parietal regions, and this is healthy controls, and you see in the kids that had perinatal stroke, um, basically the language network is entirely mirror symmetric in the right hemisphere. So in principle, language can reorganize to other regions, but we don't really know um, whether that's possible in acquired aphasia. And I know, I guess that's kind of a bold thing to say that we don't really know because people have been working on this for several decades. But I think an honest appraisal of the literature will, will reveal very little strong evidence um, for language reorganization. I'll give an example of this excellent paper by Peter Turpeltau <coughs> from 2011 shows a, um, a meta-analysis of a large variety of language tasks shows in, in healthy people um, blue-green language activations in left parietal and temporal regions, and in people with aphasia shows a suggestion of um, involvement of right hemisphere regions, but this paper does not include any statistical comparison between the aphasia group and the normal group. So we don't really know if there is actually a statistically significant um, reorganization of language in the right hemisphere let alone the, the question of what are all the different tasks that went into this meta-analysis and what were their neural substrates in the first place. I'll contrast that 
um, meta-analysis that does seem to suggest the possibility of reanalysis, I mean, um, reorganization, with this an, another excellent paper by Dorothy Sauer and colleagues in 2006. This is healthy controls here. We see a very left lateralized language network. And then in then they, uh, she looked at people with aphasia at three time points, two days post-stroke, where they saw nothing, having worked with that population at that time. That doesn't really surprise me. Um, unclear whether the patients would have been even awake within the scanner for the most part. At two weeks, they see um, this upregulation of language in the right hemisphere, um, upregulation of processing in the right hemisphere. But then at one year, they, even though many of these people continue to present with aphasia, there's actually no statistical difference between the, the pattern of the group, people with aphasia and the controls. And you can see this by looking at them, that they're identical. In this case, they did compare them, and there's no difference. So it's not really clear that language actually does reorganize at all after, in, in this kind of macro sense that I'm talking about. Um, so that's why I think that there's still a lot more study to be done on this question, because it, at the same, like, on one hand, there's no evidence for reorganization. On the other hand, there's these dramatic behavioral improvements, and like, you know, this is like a contradiction that somehow needs to be resolved. I don't know the answer to it yet. So let's, to map language areas in people with aphasia, it's kind of inherently problematic because normally to map language areas, you have people do a language task and then you compare it to some matched control task and uh, you know, by doing that comparison with real language areas. Problem is, by definition, people with aphasia are not very good at language tasks. So it kind of raises some challenges in this population that don't exist in normal language mapping context. So, I would say there are th three really critical things that we need in the functional vision paradigm for mapping language in aphasia. Firstly, it needs to be feasible. Patients need to actually be able to do the language task. Second, uh, if, if they can't, then you're just kind of looking at the neural correlates of failing to do something, which is not necessarily comparable to the neural correlates of succeeding at doing the same thing. Second, this, the task needs to be reliable. We should be able to take the same patient in the chronic state. We should be able to take the same patient, look at them on day one, look at them on day 20, and we should see the same thing. We shouldn't get a different answer depending on the day of the week or whether they've had coffee or not. We should be able to identify language areas with good test, retest, reproducibility. And thirdly, it needs to be valid. It needs to actually identify language areas and not other areas. So um, many tasks have, for instance, sensory component, they have motor components, they have executive components. Um, what we really want is to identify language regions and um, no, sorry, I was going to get a step back one sec. How we measure, how we measure reliability um, in this talk, or in, in this work, I'm going to use what's called the DICE coefficient of similarity, which is a measure of overlap between activations obtained on two different time points. So it's essentially the, the likelihood that a voxel that's activated on time one will also be activated on time two. So a DICE coefficient of zero means complete non-overlap. <coughs> The dice coefficient of 0.5 means half of the voxels overlap, and this is the holy grail would be a dice coefficient of 1 where the activations completely overlap. So that's kind of going to be the metric of reproducibility that I'm going to use throughout this work. Um, getting back to validity, um, it, it needs to activate actual language regions and not other regions. And there's a couple of things that we know about language regions in um, non-impaired speakers that we can kind of use as touchstones for assessing validity. One is that language is lateralized to the left hemisphere, regardless of what Greg might be going to say in two weeks. You get aphasia from left hemisphere strokes, you don't get aphasia from right hemisphere strokes. There is a fundamental capitalization of language in the left hemisphere. So our paradigm ought to demonstrate that. Secondly, we also understand that language, that the left frontal region and the left posterior temporal region are involved in language in essentially all um, neurologically normal people. So those, if your paradigm can't show those two things, then you, you have to question its validity. We'd like to be able to demonstrate those basic organizational principles that we know. <coughs> so let's. So I, I don't think in my in in my understanding of literature, I don't think that any of the paradigms that are widely used in aphasia meet these three criteria. And I'm going to explain why not. So narrative comprehension is a paradigm that's used a lot. You get people to listen to narratives. The control condition might be something like reversed. Reversed speech, or spectrally inverted speech, speech. it's used because it's, it's feasible. feasible. And this is an excellent study by Crinion and Price, one of the really one of the best aphasia functional imaging studies. 
And you can see that people with um, tem what they call control patients are patients without temporal lobe damage, and what they call temporal patients are patients with temporal lobe damage. And so they show that you know patients with temporal lobe damage have less activation in the left hemisphere. It's not really very surprising. But the point is that the paradigm is feasible. It's not difficult for people with, with aphasia to listen to stories in the scanner. So I'm going to give it a check mark there. But is it reliable and valid? We actually did this, the first reliability validity study that we did was just done in healthy elderly people. We scanned people four times each, as they did a number of paradigms that have been used in the literature, including narrative comprehension. So looking left to right, we're seeing five healthy older people, and on four different occasions, about two weeks apart. And this is the typical, this is narrative comprehension activations. And if you just look at the first person, we can, we can get the gist of this. Um, you know, the great posterior temporal activation at time one suddenly disappears at time two. It's back at time three, and then it's attenuated at time four. And frontal activation there at time one and time three, but like mysteriously absent at time four. That's what I mean by lack of, that's a lack of reliability, a lack of test, retest, reproducibility. Um, we can also, and that can be quantified, right, in terms of the dice coefficient, and that's shown over here on the bottom right, and um, I'm not going to go in at this point into the details of this depiction, but basically cold colors mean poor reproducibility and hot colors mean good, and it's mostly pretty poor. And what's being buried in the grid is analysis parameter choices, because the way you do your analysis is going to affect these kind of um, quantifications. That's validity, I mean, so, but you can just look at it with your eyes to see the reliability is kind of poor. Um, then the validity, well, you know, it's, it's not terrible. I mean, it certainly gives you something that looks like a language network. But it's also rather bilateral, right? Na narrative comprehension paradigms are rather bilateral. And this subject's a very good example of just a very symmetrical kind of activation pattern. And furthermore, it, like, I said, like I showed you in the first one, it doesn't really re activate final areas reliably at all. So this can all be seen in these blocks down here. This is lateralization. It's actually good. It's, it's moderately good, but it's not awesome. And the, the, the parameters that give you good um, lateralization give you the worst reliability. So you kind of like have this trade-off that just doesn't have a good outcome. This is temporal sensitivity there, very good. Frontal sensitivity, rather poor at parameters that are well lateralized. So it actually doesn't really, it's, it's kind of not very reliable and not very valid. So that's not going to be the that's not going to be an ideal paradigm to use for looking at functional reorganization. Pictionating, an excellent paradigm, used by um, wonderful people. Um, I picked this example because of uh, where I'm going to talk, and it's a great paper because I don't I don't mean to suggest that these paradigms can never be of any of any use. In in this particular in this particular case, um, it's a, it's a very interesting paper because of the correlation between activation and performance. So I'm not saying that these paradigms don't have any use. They do, and they're feasible. Most people with aphasia can do a picture naming task, and it's definitely a thing worth investigating because anomia is so ubiquitous in aphasia. Um, but in terms of a language mapping paradigm, it's really limited in terms of reliability and validity. Um, the reliability is actually, it's, it's okay, but it's mostly okay only because it activates a lot of sensory and motor regions. So you get a lot of occipitotemporal activations with a bilateral that relate to processing the pictures. And then even if you have a control condition, you often get a lot of bilateral and motor activity related to actually naming the pictures. Um, so it's the, the reliability can be a little bit deceptive. Um, the lateralization of picture naming is, is very low. As you see this, these cold colors, and you can see just by looking at the images that the great majority of what we see with picture naming is bilateral. It's actually not. <coughs> As, because this is healthy controls, it's even more of a problem. Picture naming actually probably works better in people with aphasia than in healthy controls, mainly because it's much harder for them, and so it becomes more of a language task or less of just a sort of sensory mode exercise. But it's really not very lateralizing. It mostly doesn't reveal language areas that clearly. So I'd say it's feasible, but it's only moderately reliable, and it's really not valid. Now, in clinical use of language mapping, people um, who know what they're doing, um, use semantic precision tasks, because semantic precision tasks um, are very reliable and valid. And the first one that was really proposed in the literature was Binder 1997. 
And this task basically involves um, you hear a series of animal names, and you have to press one of two buttons depending on whether or not the animal is found in the United States and used by humans. That's the decision you have to make. And then there's a control condition where you hear sequences of tones, and you have to press the button if you heard exactly two high tones, and press a different button if you didn't. So that's, in many ways, a great task. It activates very strongly left lateralized frontal and temporal regions. Um, and it has excellent test retest re reproducibility. Uh, this is the highest dice coefficient that I've seen in the literature is by this paper by Fessel et al. using a somatic precision paradigm. They reported dice coefficient of 0 0.61. So that's like very reproducible. But many of you guys work with people with aphasia. How do you think they would fare at that task? No. Heads are shaking. Um, and indeed, um, this task has been used in people with aphasia. And this is a study where it's recovered and non-recovered left MCA strokes. And we're really interested in the non-recovered, who are the people that continue to be aphasic. And this is their accuracy on this tool to force trace task. So my precision, 47.6%. That's below chance. And in fact, there are also a chance on the control task. Strangely enough, um, the Soflaski group has even though the task is so clearly problematic, ha has still yielded some very interesting results with it. So it's not, like a, it's not a total failure. It's actually, in many ways, I think, um, better to have a, a task where the behavior is problematic than to have a task that, that um, doesn't localize the regions that you're interested in at all. But it's, it's obviously not optimal to be studying people on a task that they're completely failing at. They're literally at chance. So this is kind of the decision situation. It is not feasible in people with aphasia in anything like its present form. It is reliable and valid. And so we wanted to obviously fill all the boxes with green, and we had to decide which one are we going to build on. And I think the one that we most want to build on is semantic decision, because it actually does have good psychometric properties. <coughs> you can just figure out how to make it adapt for people with aphasia. And so we designed a task that's called, we call it adaptive semantic matching task. And the goal of this is to take all the good psychometric properties of semantic decision, um, but make it doable by people with aphasia so that we can actually map language areas in people whose language performance is not um, in fully intact. So this is the task. It's very simple. It has two conditions. It's a block design. You see two words, and you have to press a single button if you think that they go together in some way. There, can, there are many different semantic relationships in the stimuli. In this case, <coughs> calendar and, and date are semantically related. <coughs> so you press the button, and that um, rectangle appears around the stimulus just to kind of indicate you pressed the button. You're not getting any feedback. The control task involves two symbol strings, and you have to press the button if they're literally identical. This is all very simple and probably has been done before in different forms, but what we did critically is that we made it adaptive. So we made both the, the language task and the, and the control task each have seven levels of difficulty, and I'll tell you in a moment how to manipulate it. And as the patient, before they even go into the scanner, they, they learn the task and they practice the task, and they're always on an adaptive staircase. So whenever they, whenever they get things right, it gets harder, and when they get things wrong, it gets easier. So, and that continues once they're in the scanner. So even when they're in the scanner, it continues to be adaptive. This is just an example of performance over the course of one run. Green means they got it right, and so they moved up a level. After, after you get two right in a row, you move up a level. But if every time you make a mistake, you get knocked down two levels. And so the patient kind of finds an asymptote of accuracy on the semantic task, and then sep separately on the perceptual control task. So it's a block design. It's going back and forth between these two tasks. They're not at the same level of difficulty. They're not really yoked to one another. They can independently. Um, you know, be adjusted to performance in an ongoing way, so like it, over the course of the scan. So the, the outcome of that is that the patient, all of control, um, or, uh, is always performing a very challenging task that's kind of like right at the limits of their ability, but is still largely doable. This is how we manipulated difficulty <coughs> um, in the most recent version, and I'll, I'll mention different versions at some point. Um, we, we manipulated six different factors to make the stimuli easier or harder. Um, the lexical frequency of the words involved, the concreteness of the words involved, the length, 
the age of acquisition, um, the degree to which the pair of words are um, related, essentially, like the, the, the obviousness of the, of the semantic relationship, which is subjective, and um, the presentation rate. So the six factors are manipulated simultaneously to make it harder or easier. You see examples of different levels. Rat mouse is very easy as a match. Then we get to kiss, love, salt, vinegar, symbol, ornament, limousine, carriage, arrangement, agreement, catastrophe, upheaval. You know what? You see how it gets harder and harder. Not only is the stimuli getting harder, but it's also getting faster. So, you know, you, you actually start to struggle um, at these higher levels. And the perceptual one is similarly manipulated. So at the easiest levels, the matches are not really manipulated, but the mismatches are. So at the easy levels, the mismatches are very obviously mismatching. And then as you get to the harder levels, the mismatches become very subtle. So we can manipulate that as well. Okay, so that's kind of our task. And what I'm now going to describe is how we validated it. So we wanted to compare it to narrative comprehension and fiction aid, which are the two most widely used paradigms in deep with aphasia in, in sort of neuroplasticity studies. We wanted to look, um, we wanted to compare these three paradigms in terms of feasibility, uh, reliability, and validity. So we had 16 people with aphasia who were recruited from a community aphasia group, and we scanned them each twice about two weeks apart. That's going to allow us to determine test retest reliability. We also had 14 neurologically normal participants. They only got scanned once because we were less interested in their test retest reliability. We were more interested in um, using them to determine validity or the extent to which we can reveal known features of language organization, i.e. lateralization and involvement of incorrect frontal and posterior temporal regions. Um, feasibility, of course, is just simply, can people do the task? Can people with aphasia do this task? Because as we saw, they, they can't do a standard clinical clinic decision task. Okay, so we assessed language function in our 16 people with aphasia using our quick aphasia battery. And this is just an aside, because um, I know that uh, a couple of people here were interested in hearing a little bit about our battery, so I just threw it in there. So we've been working on a battery that um, aims to characterize language in a multi-dimensional manner in about 15 minutes. And it has items that are carefully, um, carefully constructed in terms of covering a range of levels of difficulty to kind of like really hone in on people's level of performance. So for instance, dog, pencil, wheelchair, octopus, hammock, and escalator are difficult in that <coughs> order in people with aphasia. And that's based on an item of response theory analysis um, that came out of um, a group at the University of Washington. Um, so I'm not going to go into all the details of the battery, but um, just, I'll just point out that it, it has really good integrator reliability and pretty good test-retest reliability for everything except for the comprehension, which is um, a little bit less because they um, have the need to use false choice items, which don't give you the same psychometric properties. And um, we derive eight summary measures of language function in different domains, and they all pretty much correlate well with Western aphasia battery, so single word comprehension, sentence comprehension, um, word finding, grammatical construction, speech motor programming, repetition, reading, well, we didn't administer the reading part of the lab, um, and then the overall sort of aphasia question. So you see we have good concurrent validity with the lab, but it takes less time to perform. And it, it also has three uh, in alternate forms. So if you're doing longitudinal studies, you don't have to be using the same item every day. You can be kind of cycling between the forms. That's just an aside. Um, I can talk about that more if anyone's interested and it's freely available. So here are our 16 people with aphasia. Um, I've arranged them from more or less from most severe to least severe. Um, and for each person, you can see the profile of how they performed on the quick aphasia battery. This gentleman had severe broker's aphasia, almost tending to global because of a significant comprehension deficit. Then we had another four people with broker's syndrome, more or less. <coughs> Five with conduction, something resembling conduction aphasia. I'm a little bit you know, I'm using these labels with, with a big grain of salt. Um, then we had a patient who I classified as agromatic. She, she really didn't have any major problems apart from expressive agrammatism with preserved receptive syntax. And then we had four people that were anomic and one who was essentially recovered. She got a, a lab AQ of over 98, um, but she was, had had a stroke and in a language area and 
So, you know, this is almost the most interesting kind of patient, really. I mean, we'd really like to know, like, how is this person able to do so well? Um, so those are our participants. Okay, so let's address, first of all, feasibility. Um, were the patients able to do the task? Um, 15 of the 16, unequivocally, yes. So you can see here the accuracy in the patients is shown on the left here. In fact, this is the lady who has essentially recovered. And this is the rest of the patients. Now, because it's an adaptive staircase, they really should. They really, everybody should ultimately be the same, just theoretically. You, this, this particular staircase design that we use is supposed to converge just about 80%. So that's kind of what's supposed to happen. Um, and here's the guy with the most severe broken aphasia, kind of watering on global. Um, and so he obviously didn't do as well. There's a floor effect there. But he did perform above chance. So he, even the most impaired person was able to do the task above chance. We know he's trying to do it. On the perceptual control task, they're all basically in the vicinity of that theoretical um, accuracy that you get from an adaptive staircase. In the healthy ne neurologically normal controls, we we saw a bit of a ceiling effect on our somatic tasks. It turned out to be a bit too easy for them. We ultimately, we later fixed that. I'll show you the fixed data in, the, in a moment. Um, but all the other data, most of the data in my presentation are from the prefixed version. So there was a bit of a ceiling effect in, that, in the neurologically normal people. This is just the difficulty level that people were functioning at, like on, uh, you know, on that adaptive staircase. Um, as you can see, the people with aphasia have a very wide variability of difficulty levels, even though they're tightly, um, you know, tightly clustered in terms of accuracy, the difficulty level that they're performing at is very different. And that's exactly what we want, right? We want people to be kind of like achieving the same, but on stimuli that are appropriate for their level of function. Um, again, the healthy controls, you see that ceiling effect there that we later fixed. And then reaction time is pretty comparable across the two conditions. If anything, it's faster for semantic, which means it's just good. Because when we compare semantic to perceptual, we don't want to have any task difficulty effects confounding our language, our identified language areas. OK, here's the fixed version of the semantic paradigm, but only in healthy controls. So, so we brought down performance well off of ceiling in almost everyone. And um, that was what, kind of what we were trying to do with that. So the version that we are distributing um, is kind of a is kind of fixed in this way. Okay, so what does this task activate? Group analysis in the 14 normal people, not neurologically normal, it activates left frontal, left posterior temporal, um, and right cerebellum, although I'm going to mask that out and everything else, um, and only fo focus on cortical activations. Uh, it also, the, the fixed version actually activates a lot more anterior temporal by virtue of being more difficult because it was, that's how we fixed it, by making the hard levels be harder so that people without aphasia were not sealing out. <coughs> so kind of gets that as well in the newer version. And we'll see that at the end of the talk. Now let's look at the people. We're going to look. The next two slides are really the most important part of my talk, because we're actually going to see the data of the 16 people with aphasia. I want to spend a little bit of time looking at them, because really this is the, the meat of it. And then a lot of the following slides are going to be the statistical quantification of the patterns that, are, that we'll look at here. So um, I'm going to put eight patients on this slide and eight on the next slide. Um, and I'll just orient you. So we've got left and right hemisphere time one, and then left, left and right hemisphere of the same patient at time two. This is a depiction of their lesion location. And we're looking at the functional contrast of semantic decision versus perceptual decision. And the what I'd like to kind of focus on is to what extent does do the patterns meet the criteria that I set up in the, at the outset, i.e. reproducibility, as well as, um, well, lateralization, you know, we, don't, we can't fully assess validity in the people with aphasia because we don't really know what language networks should look like in people with large parts of the language network missing, but we can at least start to think about validity and, and start to look at, you know, is it lateralized, um, are we seeing from on temporal areas. Okay, so this is the guy who has the most severe aphasia. And you can see his language activations are very abnormal looking, but they're quite reproducible from time, time one to time two. He's at, his dice is actually only 0.42, so he, this is probably one of the least reproducible individuals. But if we look at the others, we see really good test, repro really good test retest, re reproducibility. 
sometimes I, that some of them are so good that you wonder if you accidentally like pasted the, the same figure twice and you have to look and re realize it's not quite identical in the details. A5 is a right hemisphere patient. Yes, A5 is the only one of the 16 who was, had a, <laughs> actually had a bilateral lesion, right much greater than left, and you, you don't really, the left lesion is there. This is a, this, this person certainly had aphasia, um, well, I mean, very severe aphasia, actually. Um, we weren't selecting based on lesion location, but all the rest were left NCA, and this one had this uh, very complicated history of bilateral stroke. Um, <coughs> so you see the test retest is pretty good. These are the more severe patients, and now I'll go on to the next slide. These are the getting less severe. In all cases, you can see that we, you know, say, for instance, here, the, you know, the left temporal is missing, and it is missing again when we look again. Here, even in the face of a large frontoparietal lesion, this is a patient who I classify as agromatic. Um, you know, she's very agromatic in production, and everything else is great. And, you know, she actually has both of her language areas are well preserved. Um, this is uh, interesting, okay? This is like the one of our 16 patients that actually shows right lateralization of language. And it looks very much uh, like it would in the left, except that it's mirror. Now this person had a left hemisphere lesion and they had aphasia after that left hemisphere lesion. So um, the question is, what did their language look like pre-morbidly? And of course we don't know the answer to that. You know, I'll speculate on that a bit more at the end. But notice that for, for the moment, we can reproduce this finding across the two time points that this person is right lateralized. And then these are some of the milder patients, including the lady who is essentially normal. So let's contrast that with our other two paradigms, narrative comprehension and picture naming. So this is at the top, I've got um, the healthy um, neurologically normal controls. And then I'm only showing four of the 16 patients. Specifically, I'm showing these four, <coughs> the four top ones at the second slide, including the person who's right lateral, who appears to be right lateralized. So narrative, as you can see, it's, it's rather bilateral, just in, in healthy controls. And it doesn't really, you know, you don't get a very strong frontal activation. And when you look in patients, you see um, that bilaterality kind of becomes a bit of a curse because it's kind of hard to tell, like, what is just residual right hemisphere function and what is reorganization. So this person who didn't show any indication really of being bilateral now does a bilateral on, on the narrative paradigm. And then you also see considerable um, lack of reliability in some cases. So like there's an activation here that's not present there, <coughs> for instance. And it, um, we'll do the statistical quantification of this in a moment. Here's picture naming. Um, it has that very bilateral appearance in healthy uh, neurologically normal people. And it has pretty good test retest in the patients, although not always, so for instance, this person actually has like a, a posterior MTG there, but not there. Interestingly, the, um, I'm going to back up one slide. The right lateralization of that particular patient is sort of apparent in narrative as well. And it's even apparent in picture naming, which is surprising to me, given my general feelings about the picture naming as a paradigm. But picture Are these T-scores, so the opinion percentages there, are they for multiple compares? That's a, um, no, they, they're not. Um, and they're, they're, they're the, so this is a relative thresholding approach. So I'm showing the top 5% of significant voxels, regardless of what their actual key statistic was. And that's a really important question. And, and um, we can talk about that more certainly uh, in terms of, it, it's kind of explored in when we look at like what, what role the analysis parameter settings have in determining all of these claim flame making. But more or less, you could show all of this with a, a fixed threshold, but I think that relative is, it has certain advantages. Okay, so you, um, the um, reliability and validity are not quite as good as they are for semantic. And so now here's the comparison, the statistical comparison of reliability. So here's the distribution of dice coefficients for the adaptive semantic task. And as you can see, it's higher than for the other two tasks. The other two tasks are far from terrible. I mean, there's, there's many, you know, it's certainly possible to do research using these other paradigms. 
that the adaptive paradigm gives us better test-free test re reproducibility. And I'll talk about why that is at the end of the, why I think that is at the end of the talk, which I guess is coming up pretty soon. Okay, so this is kind of getting to your question, Chris. Um, this finding is not really dependent on the many different ways that we can analyze this data. So I'm gonna orient you guys to this figure. We're gonna have a lot of other figures along the same kind of layout. I've got the three paradigms, semantic, narrative, and picture naming. And then in the big blocks, we're defining our ROI differently. So this is whole brain. This is supratentorial, so getting rid of the cerebellum, which is critical if you want to look at lateralization, because it's opposite. Uh, this is sort of plausible language regions. And if you care what, what I think those are, then I can tell you later. But, like, you know, just ruling out really crazy stuff that really can't be language. And then this is just language regions, like regions that really have a strong probability of being language regions, like left inferior frontal and posterior temporal. Like temporal. Um, so you can see like the, the test retest reproducibility that we, this is kind of the a priori, oh, I'm sorry, I missed um, some more detail. So within, within those ROIs, we then have cluster size cutoff from left to right, being, being no cluster size cutoff to, to a large cluster size cutoff. And then we have a series of relative thresholds where we're basically considering active certain percentages of voxels, <laughs> as well as absolute thresholds. And both of these have been extensively explored in the clinical language mapping literature. And there's good, re and there's good reason to use relative thresholds because you're kind of getting away from that unwanted source of variability, which is just kind of the global um, level of significance that you get on one day or another. But anyway, we sort of, we had an a priori parameter set that we chose based on our previous published paper. And, and that's the one that's always shown in black. But you can see that this, the superiority of the semantic paradigm over the other two is not really dependent on that particular parameter choice. It really holds across a whole lot of values. And in fact, you know, if you have like a well-defined hypothesis of what you're looking for, you can get your dice up to 0.75. And like in a clinical context, that's probably exactly what you do because you know, you're really just looking at those frontal and temporal regions. So that's kind of useful. Um, this part can't be analyzed for reasons that I won't bore you guys with. Um, Okay, so that's just more or less showing the, and the analysis parameters do make a difference, but they don't really make a difference to the big pattern that I'm reporting. Okay, so now let's kind of look at, turn our focus to validity. So for, for validity, we mostly want to look at the neurologically normal people because they're the ones in whom we know what language should look like. And here are our 14 people, and they all have these left frontal and temporal activations, except, um, these two pesky individuals, um, and I, so this one has a pretty, bi pretty bilateral, bilateral pattern, it's somewhat left lateralized, but only a little, little bit. bit. And, and this, this one is just completely, completely right lateralized. And like, I've scanned in my life, like, probably 100 or 200 people on language paradigms, and I've really only seen like one or two normals be right lateralized. So this was like downright annoying. You can imagine how much it complicates, like, the write up of a paper that one of your 14 normals is right lateralized for language. Um, and I was absolutely sure when I saw the, the results that there must be something wrong with her. It's like, is she left-handed? Does she have left-handed family? Like, no, no, everything was normal. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna watch the video. She's gonna turn out to be like a total whack job. I looked at the video, she was normal. So there's just, there's no explanation for why this person is, has right lateralized language. It's extremely rare, but she does. And we dealt with that in the analysis in ways that I will not go into in the scope of this talk, but you can ask me about it if you like. So the, when we compare the um, semantic paradigm with the other two paradigms in terms of the extent to which it lateralizes, we see that it's much more lateralizing, right? And it, this is just in the neurologically normal people on the left, and that's that patient that's like kind of made my life more difficult, shown in black. Notice how her right lateralization also shows up on narrative. Um, although not nearly as clearly as it does in semantic, right? The semantic paradigm kind of suggests it's a bimodal distribution, um, whereas narrative kind of looks more like a, a widespread left tending distribution, but narrative, like actually four of the normals have more activity right than left in narrative. That's, that's not to say, I'm not trying to really say that narrative is wrong. I mean, the right hemisphere is not uninvolved in processing language, but from an aphasia, to study neuroplasticity of aphasia recovery, it's very unhelpful to use a paradigm that is potentially bilateral in normals. 
because it just doesn't give you any ability to tell what's reorganization and what's just preserved normal activity. Um, so as you can see, the um, semantic paradigm is much more lateralizing than the other two, and that's statistically significant. Um, interestingly, we, I mean, I looked also at the people with aphasia. Um, we don't really have strong hypotheses about how language should be organized, but it's just strikingly normal, right? So 15 of the 16 are very are strong, continue to be strongly left lateralized per the semantic paradigm. Again, the narrative paradigm gives a much less clear picture, and picture naming does not lateralize. This finding also holds regardless of how those parameters are manipulated. There's the extent of lateralization for semantic, narrative, and picture naming in healthy controls, and then in people with aphasia. It's just so similar. I think that, that, that that's not what the study is about, but there's like a, that's kind of an interesting finding. And this is a, you do this as a block design where you have do the task and there's a period of a break and they do the task. It's, it goes language perceptual, language perceptual, language perceptual. It's just A B block design. Okay. Um, so one so that was lateralization. That's one of our essays of validity. Our other essay of validity is the ability to activate frontal and temporal regions. We found that frontal regions were reliably activated by the semantic paradigm, but less so by the other two paradigms. This was true in aphasia too, although of course some people with aphasia do not activate frontal regions because they don't have them. That's fine. That's not, you know, a problem with validity. That finding is also holds across parameters. <coughs> and then in terms of temporal regions, the semantic paradigm and the narrative paradigm do a fine job of identifying those reliably. Picture naming less so. And again in aphasia, most people continue to have those activations. Some people of course don't when the area in question is damaged. That's not sensitive to parameter set either. So this is my favorite part of the talk, which I finished on the plane, I guess. So you get to make that column be all green. It's a feasible, reliable, and valid paradigm. Why um, does it work better than the others? Well, I think the, the most critical thing, of course, is that the paradigms are adaptive. And what that, and the consequence of that is that the processing that's taking place under the different conditions is highly constrained in a way that it isn't in the other paradigms. So just to take narrative, for example, some people get really interested in reversed speech. They come out and they're like, was that Russian? It sounded like it could have been Russian. Like, yeah, you, you've just like obliterated your contrast by paying too much attention to the control condition. Whereas when everything's very constrained by this challenging task where you're on the threshold of your ability, we know what your brain is doing. Everybody's brain is doing the same thing. And that, um, I think, helps hugely with reliability because it means we're just creating a consistent cognitive state across people and across occasions for the same person. It's also very important to use a single button press. People with aphasia have a lot of trouble, some of them, learning to associate one choice with one button press and the other choice with the other button press. It's much easier to teach a single concept if it matches with the button. And that applies to the language condition and the control condition. We have this kind of structured training that's important. It takes about 15 minutes usually to train someone. And the activeness of the task, as well as the fact that it involves comprehension, is kind of what gives you, I think, the frontal and the temporal reliably. There are some limitations um, that should be noted. Uh, it doesn't, it only identifies frontal and temporal lateralized language regions. These are not the only important regions of the language network. Of course, there's many other components to the language network. And I'll talk in just a moment very briefly, even though I've run out of time, about some work in progress where we're trying to identify additional parts of the net language network using a problem <coughs> task. Second, not all patients will be able to perform the task. We had one who barely performed it, and certainly if you have global aphasia or somatic dementia, vertices aphasia, you might not be able to do it. Um, our, despite best efforts to use the adaptive staircase procedure and have the performance be matched. It was not perfectly matched statistically. We saw some ceiling effects. We kind of mostly resolved them, but there's still like some performance um, mismatches, which kind of got to com complicate interpretation a little bit. And our, <coughs> our final dice coefficient was 0.66, which I'm happy with, 
but still, you know, that's only two thirds over that. And, uh, and we still, in doing longitudinal research, need to use other things like multiple baselines and group studies and whatnot to ensure statistical significance. You still can't point to a difference and say, hey, that's different. You've got to do more than that. Very briefly, this is our work in progress um, using adaptive phonological matching paradigms to see if we can get the region that we believe is important for phonological encoding in the inferior parietal lobe. And we have two tasks. One's a rhyming task and one is a syllable counting task. Both use pseudo words. And this is all in healthy controls so far. So this is like the revised version of the semantic paradigm. As you can see, like I mentioned before, it has more anterior temporal. Um, it doesn't have any parietal at all, but these phonological tasks get that parietal and they do it in a very lateralized manner. So if this is kind of showing the sensitivity for identifying frontal, temporal, and parietal, so here's the semantic task. It's great at frontal and temporal. It does not identify parietal at all because it doesn't involve phonological encoding. But the rhyme task does um, identify parietal in most people, 13 out of 16 normals. It doesn't have the same kind of sensitivity that our semantic task does, but I mean, for, for frontal and temporal regions. And syllables. Um, no, it's, well, it's all visual. Yeah. Uh, the syllable counting task works pretty much the same, and it's very strongly lateralized. So all 13 people that showed that left that rhyming parietal activation, they always show it very lateralized. So I think we can potentially kind of have a more nuanced language mapping approach that doesn't just sort of say eloquent cortex versus not, but we'll start to talk about you know, regions that have different functions. So I'll conclude just by um, reiterating what I mentioned along the way, that even though this is not really a study about language reorganization, it's really a method study, there, are, there is like some basic findings about reorganization that kind of emerge as a byproduct, which is that there is surprisingly little. And it's really, you know, basically any area that's intact is gonna mostly have normal looking activation in it. Obviously any, any area that's damaged is not. And, and there's very little evidence for a realization of the right hemisphere, only one of the 16 subjects, and it's very plausible that that gentleman had bilateral language to begin with. I mean, that would certainly be my guess. Um, and, you know, obviously our longitudinal research, which we're doing right now, looking at people from, you know, day one on, is gonna be able to ultimately answer that question, hopefully. But I think that there's, it's really, you know, shift of language to the right hemisphere, which is obviously the way that what would happen to a kid, the perinatal stroke, that's what happens, and they're fine, does not really happen for adults. So, and also we don't see a lot of evidence for perilesional recruitment. So it looks like probably the most important neuroplasticity probably happens within the surviving regions of the language network. And that is consistent with um, other findings, including findings from the Soplaski lab using their rather similar task, even though they have problems with patient behavior. Um, and they, I think that their work does end up uh, kind of converging on this same, posi same position, that it's the residual network that's gonna be largely responsible for recovery. So all of our materials uh, and scripts and whatnot are available for others to use if they may be interested. And uh, thank you very much again for inviting me. And I look forward to your questions. So is it possible that um, when you make the statement that you, you don't see any shift to the right hemisphere, that this is specific to the kind of language component that you're tapping into with the semantic decision task? So is it possible that um, narrative speech or the picture naming, the, the language abilities that are involved in that, that they tend to shift to the right hemisphere, but that what you're measuring semantic judgment, which is a very specific <coughs> language component, right? That that has less of a, that just, it's, it's, it's that particular component that just happens to not shift so much. Do you, how do you feel about that? Um, I, I don't, I, I think that the semantic judgment task, even though it seems rather specific, I, I don't, I really see it just as a way of engaging the core parts of the language system, because I mean, you have to go through so many processes to perform that. I, I mean, apart from encoding for production, I mean, it, it really goes through like much of the rest of the language system. So, 
Sorry? Bypass infection. Oh, yeah, so that's not trivial. That's why we've kind of started to work on this biological encoding stuff. Um, but yeah, so it's possible that, especially with biological encoding, and maybe that's where we'll see it. Um, but, you know, picture a narrative, I mean, you, you're going to see right hemisphere, I mean, actually, you can see it in our data that um, those are going to appear to shift to the right in people with aphasia. Um, so notice. Here, this is the not neurologically normal at the top. Notice how they are left lateralized for narrative, and that goes away in aphasia, right? So that's the appearance of a shift to the right. But I would argue that that is really just an artifact of taking away the left hemisphere and being left with the functional right hemisphere. So that's not the same thing as reorganizing to the right. So it may it may be that some other things that are not that uh, to the right, and phonology would be a great candidate. Because we're definitely not, that's the one thing, important thing that we're really missing. Um, but yeah, we don't know yet. Julius. So um, I have several questions, and I'm, many of them I can just ask in person. But the first one, with regards to validity of tasks, I mean, it seems to me that you just sort of came up with your own definition of what a valid task is. Because if it's bilateral, therefore you determine that it's not valid. I don't really buy that. I mean, if, if you see bilateral activation, including in the left hemisphere language areas, well, if somebody is doing naming, which I think is one of the core problems that we see in, in aphasia as a nomium, I just don't see why, is, why, why does that make the task invalid? Because you oh, well, I mean, it doesn't make, I mean, the task is valid for many purposes, right? I mean, anomia is, exactly. is, 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 exactly. a, is a very useful task. Yes. But is it a useful task? I mean, is it a useful task for studying reorganization of language networks? I mean, that's that's the sense in which I'm talking about validity. I'm not saying that anomia is never a useful task. I don't know task. if it's any less valid than your task. Well, I mean, the thing is it activates bilateral brain regions, and we know that the right hemisphere is not capable of naming all by itself. So whatever that, all that right hemisphere activity is, it's not uh, able to sustain successful naming. And so it's, it's kind of, in that sense, invalid. I mean, it's, it's showing me areas that I know from aphasia to not be involving naming, right? So therefore, you're convinced that there's no right hemisphere of reorganization that is associated with improvement in language. I'm not saying that's not, wrong. I'm, no, no, I'm not, I'm not convinced. I just, we just don't see it yet in our data. I mean, we, we don't have that many subjects. And you know they're all recruited from a community aphasia group, and I don't know whether that's a biasing sure. kind of recruitment context. Sure, but you and know that others certainly believe that right hemisphere organization is very important. Yeah. Dr. Slau, for example, I think Sidney Thompson has made the, the case for that as well. I mean, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to see how it all pans out, right? I mean, I, it's just what I've seen so far. I actually I would love it if we could see a reorganization of the right hemisphere. When I started this work. That's exactly what I expected to see. Um, it's kind of boring to not be able to show any reorganization. Yes, but your point is that the patient only task is invalid because it shows bilateral activation. I just, I just don't agree with it. I see, I, it's just based on your specific definition. Yeah, but my definition is motivated. We, we, can, we can definitely like take it up further. I, I don't mean to suggest that just because I mean, let me talk about narrative. Um, I don't think that it's nar the narrative task is wrong by telling us that the right hemisphere is involved in narrative comprehension, for instance. I'm sure that it is. Um, and I don't think it's giving an inaccurate, it's not giving an, an inaccurate, you know, depiction of what the brain regions are involved in narrative comprehension. But as a task for studying organization, narrative is somewhat challenging to use because it has a strong right hemisphere component in neurologically normal people. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that it doesn't mean the task is wrong or and not has any use. It just means that it's not very good for this purpose. And I think I'd make similar claims about fiction I mean. We can talk more for sure. Yeah, yeah. The other thing that you touched on which I think is very important is that we do fMRI for many different reasons. And the point that I was make that for example, the picture naming task, we used in our TVCS study, our clinical trial, which is now finished. And whether you need to do fMRI for TVCS localization, that's a totally different question. But 
we used it, so we wanted to look at the areas that were accurate in the left hemisphere, the temporal parietal cortex, uh, to sort of put our electrodes in the right place. Mm -hmm. I think out of 74 subjects, we saw temporal and or parietal activation in 73. So for that purpose, it seemed to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, I, I put up one of your, I mean, you know, I came here to criticize fiction writing in this context, <laughs> but, I, but only in this context. That's why I, I put up one of your studies deliberately because I was, and, and you know, I love the Crinian and the Price study too. I'm not saying that these paradigms don't have their uses, but I, I'm just making a point about if you want to study functional plasticity, it doesn't really help you to have a task that activates both hemispheres in controls. You could still look at the relative shift though, right? I mean, you seem to be making the argument that, well, if you see in the healthy participants, in the, in the non so participants, you see right hemisphere activation in normal processing, that means we can no longer make the argument that there's a shift to the right hemisphere after stroke because there was already activation there, right? Mm -hmm. But you can still look at the relative size or location of that shift, right? So it may be that there is indeed still additional right hemisphere shift on top of the normal right hemisphere activation that you would see. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's not impossible. It's not impossible, but nobody's shown it as far as I know. But the other thing, Stephen, is that if you do a pre-post comparison, let's say that we just do a contrast between pre and post, if the right hemisphere isn't doing anything, or at least there's no change if that's happening there, why is that a problem? Sorry. If there is reorganization, it's only happening in the left hemisphere, wouldn't you only see, wouldn't you still see that with your picture making there? Um, possibly. I mean, I think that most of what you see with picture naming is, is not language related. So I, I think it's kind of, you most know. Of it, I mean, some of it is probably picture related. Some of it is just sensory motor, for sure. You see bilateral motor cortex. Mm -hmm. And bilateral occipitotemporal. Yeah. And, and, and they're both abutting, abutting the genuine language regions. So it makes it hard. I think it makes it hard. Did you use a control for picture naming, or is it just picture naming? No, in the first study we didn't, and that was a mistake. Um, but in this, in, in the study of normals, but in this study we did use uh, scrambled pictures. Mm -hmm. it's, but, you know, as you guys probably have seen in your own data, that doesn't take out all the oxygen temporal processing for obvious reasons. Right? Scrambled pictures just don't go through that. Stream is fine. Yeah, we didn't use scrambled pictures, we used real ones. Abstract. But they were abstract. So okay. maybe that explains part of the difference. But yeah, real They were controlled for like luminance and other factors. So what's the um, relationship between validity and reliability? Because I know that's that's a big argument um, going on. And obviously, the more valid a task, the more reliable activation is going to be, in theory. Um, but there's a lot of other things that are obviously contributing to that. So. If we're going along with what Julia says for you know whether or not you define valid as being left hemisphere or whatever you're expecting, how much of that are we expecting to kind of relate to the reliability peaks? Um, okay, so okay, repeating the question for the um, the video, uh, it's about the, re the relationship between reliability and validity. I, I think you're right. Um, you. It's impossible to be valid if you're not reliable, right? Because if you're not reliable, that means you're giving different answers each time, so you, you can't possibly be valid. Um, but it is possible to be reliable without, without yeah, being valid. valid. Right. So you can like, consistently give the wrong answer yeah. each time. And, and I kind of mentioned that um, you know, one of the reasons why picture naming is actually more reliable than narrative, at least it wasn't our first study, but not our second study, is because you do reliably show those bilateral sensory motor activations, even though they're not necessarily language related. Yeah, and I'm just wondering if it's more helpful, at least for longitudinal research to, in aphasia, to be focused on the reliability aspect of it, because obviously that's what we're looking for, right? If you're going to, it doesn't matter what task you do, if they do it well to the point where the reliability is good, um, <coughs> It almost doesn't matter what you're measuring, right? Because you're looking for change. You're looking for change in language areas, though. Yeah. So I think it's it's I think you need both reliability and validity. Like if, if you're seeing change in things that are not language areas, that would be kind of weird. Well, 
But many people have shown that. I mean, you know the theory of, I mean, so many people have shown like elements change or whatever it is. But um, I'm just saying in terms of reliability, it gets so difficult when you're looking at certain groups of individuals, which you mentioned, like people with heart disease aphasia may not do so well with this. People who don't have reading intact may not mm, do yeah, so well with this. I didn't mention that, but you're right. Um, not having reading intact would be, uh, uh, that'd be hard. It'd be hard. So, we have an auditory version of this too. I'm sure there are ways to get around. I'm just, I'm just kind of thinking, you know, in the long term, what's the, what's going to be the critical thing? Mm -hmm. I want to really compare across studies. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's, a, I, I don't think that everybody should necessarily use the same paradigms. I mean, you know, each. We all have different populations of individuals. Each, yeah, each, each research is going to have their own yeah. specific questions, and you know. I wouldn't advocate that everybody does exactly the same. I think that would be actually a big mistake, like if we're already just did the same thing. But yeah, I mean, I think one of the reasons why, you know, some people have, you know, you mentioned like, you know, people have claimed that thalamus changes, people have claimed all kinds of things change, right? But there's like, right. there's a big, there's a, you know, there's a huge problem with statistical significance, the determination of statistical significance in FMRI is very bad in the literature in general, as has been pointed out in this, you know, paper from, 2016, um, and it's so much worse than that in the aphasia recovery literature. Yeah, it's just like a whole other level of bad. I mean, like 90% of the studies don't have any meaningful, you know, correction model comparisons. Well, and sensitivity across time too, right? When you do a task five times, you can obviously increase your sensitivity too. Yeah. So I, I, I'm. There's not that many studies in the literature that even, you know, that really show anything that's statistically robust. Question from online. Uh -huh. You may be able to pull it up if you want. I'll read it to you. Then you drag that up. Yeah. Then maybe click the chat. Um, from Danielle. Did I understand correctly that the adaptive semantic task uses two languages? And if that is correct, I'd like to know if the other tasks uses both languages as well as how the semantic relationship across the language was considered. I wonder because if the other tasks only use one language, or the adaptive tasks use two languages, that might result in differences in processing, it may not be due to task differences, but due to language differences. I, I think she must be referring to the perceptual control task in the, the non-English script. So in a sense, I wouldn't say that that's a language. That's not, not a language in the same way that the control conditions of the other tasks in that language, which I probably may have glossed over, but the control conditions of the narrative is backwards narrative, control conditions of picture naming is scrambled pictures, and the uh, symbol strings in the adaptive semantic task are akin to others, i.e., they're not, it's not like it's a second language, but it's like a non language um, sensory motor matched condition. I hope that answers your question. I have a question based on that. Well, would you say that um, your control condition for the new task is just it's a far superior control condition than for the other tasks? It controls all for all the language processing. And I could be responsible for I get such nice stuff lateralized language processing. Maybe you didn't put enough thought into the control conditions for the other one. There's other people that put more thought into it. Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, I use for the other ones, I use the control conditions that are widely used in the literature um, because the aim was to compare to a common practice. That said, I mean, I, I mean, I can, I've never found a better control. I mean, I think backward speech is a great control for narrative. I mean, I've, I've used narrative in lots of studies. I mean, I, you know, and I, I think it's a, it's a really good task and it's a really good control. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't unless you can really constrain the kind of processing that people are doing, then you're going to be limiting your potential liability. I mean, it might still work great at a group level, like if you get a bunch of nulls into the scanner and have them all do narrative and backwards narrative, you know, if, once you've got 12 subjects or so, you're going to see a very nice language network, including its bilateral component, um, which is, you know, not mirror image, but it has a different structure in the right. Um, but, but yeah. Um, yeah, I do think the control has to be better. But I don't think that I could come up with a better one for the other ones. But if you can, I'd love to know. <laughs> <laughs> I love your control conditions. Thanks. I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, also, a minor question about the control task and the semantic judgment task. So I've done a previous version or a version of that where we just had letter strings 
absolute control. So rather than thinking, was there a particular reason why you would not use that as Le well? Less language, right? I mean, like when you go to just non non English orthography, you're just taking out one other piece of language. Because, because, yeah, like you said, I mean, you could see it as a semantic decision task, which it obviously is. But to me, it's like it's a proxy for just engaging as much of the language network as possible. Admittedly, not production, though. but yeah. So that's that's fine. You could argue the other way around, but it's more like looking at letters. So all you're taking out is looking at letters, and now what you're taking out is looking at symbols. I guess you, yeah. I think your point is stronger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I do like my own. I think I vote for Dirk A over Dirk B. So I'm a grad student, and I kind of like think these things clinically, and like how are we going to apply this, like how we evaluate these people. And I was thinking of someone that I saw that did have, they had a right hemisphere stroke and she had vision. And so she's left handed quickly. So we can assume that her language areas were in the right hemisphere. So like, what do we know about like how someone that has this freak right hemisphere area reorganizes after that? Yeah, that's a really great question. I, I, I think that people with right hemisphere language are, are more likely to be bilateral like, than people with left hemisphere language. Probably, I'm not 100% sure about that. And I suspect that people who are bilateral to begin with probably have a better cost of recovery. You know, and we, and we see like a, you know, a small minority of people, like maybe, I don't know, 10% of people are, are bilateral, like of, of normal right-handers. And, and I would suspect that they are probably gonna do better recovery. But, but you know, that's kind of very indirect, right? Because you might, we're, we're kind of layering two assumptions on top of one another. Um, I raised my hand like five times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, just to say, so you commented on previous fMRI studies being poor in, in aphasia. I mean, yeah, they're not great, but also I think we need to cut some of these people some slack. I mean, doing treatment research is extremely difficult. It takes a long time. If you're on the tenure track, nobody should be doing <laughs> treatment research. Mm -hmm. They're completely insane, or they don't want tenure. <laughs> but I would say is that I think that progressively, at least I hope so, that it's getting better. <coughs> I understand why those studies were like they were at the time, but I, I, I think that we were getting better. Right? I, I definitely think we're getting better. Yeah. And, and and you know I wasn't, you know I, I wasn't meaning to disparage the whole field when I said you know if somebody randomly has like one patient and then they test them at time A and time B and do a fix fix analysis and be like the thalamus. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, that, but that's, 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 that's yeah. a lot of stuff that's a lot better yeah. than that. Yes. And, and especially in the last five or six years. And 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 you know, I, I in the in the course of my talk, I pointed out some studies that I think are, all the studies I talked about are studies that I think have made important contributions. Yeah. So so you know, I'm not like trying to trash the whole field and. You know, I just didn't want this in a C-star talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they cracked all, all over the whole field. Uh, anyway, so I have a question. So, how would you feel if a neurosurgeon wanted to use your task for research or not? Oh, I would absolutely advocate it without a shadow of doubt. And in fact, my my task is used in pre pretty much every pre-surgical procedure in Phoenix. It's, it's being used by the, the neuropsychologist that kind of does all of that. Uh, yeah, so um, I think it's a an excellent pre-surgical task, mm -hmm. and and you know. We sort of had this idea that pre-surgical patients are not aphasic, um, but actually, like according to my colleague in Phoenix, it's implemented that a, a decent minority of them are, and so the task is especially valuable in the people with uh, actual aphasia due to the to the tumors in most cases. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I'm one of my plans for the coming year is to convince the people at Vanderbilt to, to use this research plan because I, I do think it's you know. It's quicker, it's more reliable than the alternatives. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Of course, I would advocate using picture naming as well. Any other questions from our room? I think so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.